Okay, here we go. Die Menschen auf dem Teppich fühlen. Here we go. Hello. Welcome. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> We're just pull up our notes here. Okay. So welcome. We're live streaming for the first time uh, to celebrate 10,000 uh, subscribers. So thank you all for uh, making this happen. And thank you for joining us today. Yes, hi, and thank you. And forgive us for any uh, strangeness with the live stream because we really don't know what we're doing and we're still figuring it out. <laughs> but hello. <laughs> it's kind of weird because we're seeing a, a lag on our screen. So yeah, I'm going to see if I can. It's already hard uh, talking while watching yourself. OK, I'm going to get rid of that there. I'm going to use the chat to cover ourselves up. So oh, now perfect. we're staring at ourselves talking good. three seconds before. Good, good, good. <laughs> so at any point during this uh, live stream, please feel free to uh, type in some questions um, and uh, we'll try and answer them. Oh, look, we've got people already. Got people already. Wow. <laughs> oh, a little, it's a little too quiet. OK, let's see if I can make that better. Uh, how do I do that? Video, be done with the mic. Yeah, the little. Vol not that, not the, not the making it. How do I change the settings? Just to, ooh, good question. <laughs> no, I keep muting it. It's not what I want to do at all. How do, oh, maybe this? How do I Try right-clicking it? Properties. How do I make it go louder? <laughs> I can't do it on that, right? No, no, I don't think so. Okay. Um, let me put back to the this. Oh yeah, there should be a volume. <laughs> Look at all these people here. Now wow. we just need to make it louder. Okay, how about we just talk louder? We'll, we'll talk, and I'll talk work louder. On, I'll work on the audio. <laughs> um, so thank you to all our uh, supporters on Patreon as well. Um, it's uh, It certainly helps uh, get these videos out. And um, I should, of course, introduce ourselves. Um, I'm Mark, of course, probably the one you've seen most on screen. Uh, and this is Avon. Hi. And she does a lot of work behind the scenes, so you don't see her as often, but she's uh, a, an important uh, part of the team. Um, okay. Yeah, and there was a question about us already. Yeah. Um, that we've been together. If you mean we're so we are married, and we've been together since ninety six, Six. and living together since ninety seven, and married since two thousand. So there you go. <laughs> a while. <laughs> and we've been working on on this project yeah. since the beginning. Yeah. I guess twenty fourteen is when we launched the channel. Uh, yeah, 2014. 2014. It, the first video wired up in September 2014. Okay, I think I've raised the gain a little bit, but I don't know. Let us know if you can't hear us. But thank you to everyone for joining us. I'm looking at the chat and... Uh, hi! hi. <laughs> and the fact that one of them, one of you is our child is uh, nice too. <laughs> hi! <laughs> he was the first uh, to leave a comment, so that's good. But <laughs> thanks for all the nice uh, comments. So what we thought we'd do is start with some people have left us some questions already in some of the uh, in the comments on the YouTube channel and have uh, sent us some emails. So we thought we'd start by answering some of those questions, but we'll also take questions or comments as you guys go along, um, if you have anything to add in. And then, you know, we'll answer any other questions, chat, and we have some other things we could talk about if we run out of stuff to talk about. <laughs> All right. All right. Okay, so first thing then was a question from, let me see this, um, confis confiscator, confis conf confiscator um, left a comment asking, I'd like to know if there are words derived from older onomatopoeia words. Wouldn't it be cool if we had a word that came from the sound of some extinct bird, for example? Okay, that's a leap, but any etymological connections relating to onomatopoeia would be interesting. So, Mark, take it away. Well, of course, there are actually quite a few words in English that have um, imitative origins, onomatopoeic origins. Um, 
uh, I can name a few, uh, uh, for instance, uh, general ones before we get into animals specifically. Um, so there's a root, pneu, uh, which I guess is most recognizable from uh, pneumatic uh, through the Greek side of things. Uh, it means breath, so the sound of breath, really. Um, but what's really interesting is that uh, through the Germanic branch, so uh, because of Grimm's law, that P, the P, the initial P in pneu uh, becomes an F sound, so we get pneu in the Greek languages. Oh, I know what word you're going for. Yep. <laughs> this is my favorite. And this is really interesting. So this is the only example I can think off of the top of my head that this happens to, though there may be others. Um, the, that initial F, so here's here's a little bit of trivia. There used to be two different symbols for the letter the letter S. There's the sh the short S, which looks like our modern S, and there's the long S, which looks very much like an F. And so what seems to have happened is, is this is a spelling error. People took the F N uh, as S N because F N is a weird letter combination to begin with, and it's much easier to say S N in English. Um, and so F N became sna and gives us the word sneeze. So it was fneeze. Fneeze. It used to be the word fneeze in Old English and in earlier Middle English. Uh, it was fneeze, <laughs> which is quite funny just in itself. Um, and uh, there are a number of other uh, words, uh, F, sorry, SN words uh, that have to do with the nose. Think of snout or uh, snort or um, sneer, or snot, even. Um, so that seems to be set good sound sense. Those The SN combination seems to have sort of reminded people of the nose and, and the sounds that come from the nose. Um, though I suppose originally it was the pn, pneu, if that sounds a bit like a sneeze to you. Um, a pneu. A pneu, yeah. <laughs> um, so that's an interesting body sound uh, that, that comes from uh, imitative uh, an imitative origin. Um, one just thing uh, to the great green menace. I'm sorry you have to go. I saw your question. I will answer it, and I will also post. We will post this on the on the uh, channel. I think yeah, actual, yeah. Either unlisted or public, but either way, you can definitely look at the stream later if you can't uh, stick around now. So thanks for posting, and I will get to your question. I promise. Okay, continue. <laughs> All right. Another body sound. This is a bit of a naughty one or a rude one, I suppose. <laughs> Shocking. <laughs> um, is the Proto-Indo-European root kaka, which you probably can already guess what it refers to. But specifically, it refers to the sound. Uh, and I'll quote here from um, uh, my source for this one is uh, Calvert Watkins. Um, he writes, uh, imitative of the glottal closure during defecation. Now, I'm... <laughs> okay, I know there's various sphincters in your body closing yes. during navigation, but... So I'm assuming by glottal closure, he didn't mean the glottis, which is the folds in the vocal cord. I'm assuming he meant to say uh, from the sphincter, sound of the sphincter closing during defecation. Maybe, or maybe the... Oh, sound. Yeah, maybe, I suppose. <laughs> Not to I be coarse. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a lady, I would never make such a sound, but I, yes. I, I'm sure that might happen to other people. <laughs> Uh, so, um, you know, that's the sound of pooping, I guess, one way or the other. <laughs> hey kids, hope you're enjoying this. <laughs> now, let's get on to animals, because that was really the, the, uh, the heart of this question. I'm uh, unaware of any that can be traced back uh, specifically to an extinct animal. Um, okay. But uh, there certainly are... Um, there certainly are animal words uh, like um, the the sound of the whippoorwill is imitative of its call, uh, and um, the the Puerto Indo European root gera uh, to cry hoarsely uh, may be imitative as well, and that gives us crow, for instance. So the sound of a crow right. sound. Um, specifically, extinct animals. The closest I could come to uh, is uh, the the extinct animal. Uh, Hyracotherium. Um, it's an extinct ungulate from which horses evolved. Um, now it's a it's a learned uh, coinage. Um, you mean the 
animals at the time didn't call it a herakotherium. No. It was not its given name at the time. <laughs> Nor was it an early human word for it or something. Um, yeah. In fact, it's long extinct. It's right? long yeah. extinct. It's long extinct. And um, the the actual animal name that uh, the Greeks sort of referred to, to is uh, Hyrax, which is still a, a living animal. Um, it's a kind of shrew-like uh, animal or a rodent-like animal, but it's not actually closely related to rodents or rabbits or anything like that. Um, it's in fact more closely related to elephants, I believe, which is sort of surprising. But in any <laughs> case, uh, this this little small furry animal, uh, I guess, was thought to make uh, a, a a sound um, that uh, sounded like hi-rax? sounded like well sounded sounded like um, a buzzing sound or a whispering sound. Uh, because the root is traced back to swear, um, S-W-E-R in Proto-Indo-European. Mm-hmm. Um, and it also gives us words like swirl, swarm, and absurd. Oh, our, our friend Wombat37, hello, uh, said uh, that he saw a hyrax last week rather bigger than a shrew. Think cat size. Cat size. I, okay. I'm, I'm assuming that was in the zoo, not the backyard. But <laughs> <laughs> unless, unless they roam Yorkshire. <laughs> um, but go on, sorry. <laughs> yeah, so makes a, a, a buzzing sound i guess i don't know that makes it a little um, less bizarre that it's related to an elephant yes mouse size mouse seems size would particularly be yes. bizarre. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. right okay thank you yes that's confirmed closely related closely to an related elephant to, thank you yeah <laughs> um and so swarm as well comes from that root i guess the sound of a swarm of bees is a buzzing sound that's mm-hmm. that's pretty clear um so interesting uh so that's the closest i could come to an extinct animal with an imitative sound okay um, before we move on to the next one that we had already, I've already got a bunch of questions that people have been posting, sure. so why don't we answer a couple of those, mm-hmm. um, but I just need to copy something down here. It is most interesting. To... Okay, <laughs> and then we'll do that, because I don't want to lose um, some of these behind. Okay, so Ido Boss 101 possibly, mm-hmm. I may mm-hmm. mispronounce your handles. Um, asked, how did you two get interested in etymology? I thought we could probably do that pretty easily. Yeah, well, I've been interested in etymology myself for quite a while. Um, I guess the thing that really kind of focused me on it was as a graduate student, I worked on a dictionary project, uh, the Dictionary of Old English. So my my background is in medieval studies. I particularly focused on Old English language. And as a graduate student, I worked as a research assistant at the uh, Dictionary of Old English project at the University of Toronto. And so, um, you know, I've been thinking about language history and um, there's a there's an element of uh, specifically, of I suppose, etymology in uh, my dissertation. Um, But when I came to do a channel, uh, when I wanted to do something about language history, it occurred to me that that probably the thing that would be most popular would be etymology, because people always seem to be quite fascinated. You know, where do the words come from? Are these words related? Um, So I thought that would be a good kind of question to answer. All right. Um, Yeah, and mine, uh, I've... I've not studied anything to do with etymology, but I will say that um, my 16th birthday present that I asked for that was by like, oh, it's your sweet 16. What do you want to have? What what, what special present do you want? We'll give you something a little more expensive than usual. Um, I asked for uh, the Oxford Etymological Dictionary (laughs) and received it and was thrilled. So it goes back a long way. I think it's just been an interest in language overall for me. Um, It's why I went and did Latin and Greek in high school because I wanted to be able to do that and it was available and have stayed in classics. I, I'm a, I studied classics at the University of Toronto and went on to do a PhD in it and that's what I teach now and I still just really like language and I love when teaching Latin, pointing out all of the roots, partly so that people can understand um, the Latin better. It's easier to keep vocabulary in your head if it's tied to an English word, but also just because it's interesting. Um, so I think, and then, you know, once Mark started doing this, I just, because I was helping out, I learned lots of things, lots and lots of things, <laughs> more than it gets to the channel. Trust me, the number of dinner table conversations to start with, did you know that? <laughs> uh, yes, we are complete nerds. Thank you, chat. That is completely true. Total nerds have been nerds since I was a kid. <laughs> Never not a nerd. <laughs> um so yeah, that's that's basically it, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, sorry, I'm 
just want to make sure I'm keeping track of all these questions because there's lots of them, which is good. Um, so why don't I ask you another one? Sure. Some of these you may not be able to actually answer now, but some of them I think you can. Martin Poitre uh, asked, uh, what's the language you enjoy hearing most? I would say Old English. Uh, that w That's what really um, made me want to do medieval language and focus on languages in particular. Um, when I was a uh, first year undergraduate, my uh, prof, in it, this was like a survey course, everything from Old English all the way up to modern. And uh, my prof, uh, David Carlson, read out some Old English from a, a bit from Beowulf. Uh, we were reading it in translation, not in the original language at that point, of course. Um, but he read out some just to show us what it sounded like. And I just fell in love with the sound of the language. And then when I started to study it more closely, the you know how it was put together, I became even, even more fascinated and uh, wanted to, to focus on that. So I think it's the sound of Old English that still just gets me. I, I love hearing it. <laughs> so you spend most of your time sad then because you don't hear it most of the time I don't hear it well, unless I read it to myself <laughs> um, all right um, uh, oh yeah so Great Green Menace who had to leave um, asked do you think English will remain the lingua franca on this planet predictions are hard to make um, <laughs> I would I would imagine to, at least to some extent yes um, though I would predict that the form of English that becomes most important is going to change. Um, I think we're going to see a sort of global English, a global variety of English uh, become more and more important. And the sort of centers standard English. of standard English, British English, North American English are going to become perhaps less important compared to that global Engl English. Yeah, I and and uh, the English spoken by non-native English speakers too, yes. right? So yes. English as uh, as a true lingua franca, where it really yeah. is a language spoken by many people who are not English speakers or not not native English speakers, as yeah. opposed to that's going to be the global English that I'm talking about. Yeah, rather than that, everyone's going to start learning English as a native language. Yeah, you know, but that more and more people, and that even people who are native English speakers may end up needing to learn mm -hmm. global English yeah. as that lingua franca. Yeah. I think that's um, a bit, but predictions, I mean, mm -hmm. that's if we make it through the next year without the planet being destroyed. Yes. But, you know, <laughs> watch out for some other languages, too, um, particularly Asian languages, I think, are going to become more and more important on the global stage. I mean, they already are. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I can't keep up. <laughs> <laughs> we were worried nobody would want to be uh, asking us anything at all. Thank you, guys. Um Martin Procure also asked uh, what language evolution is most interesting to study. To study? I think the semantic shifts of words is is quite interesting. I mean, the, the, the sort of phonological changes are, are fascinating too, um, particularly when you have examples like fneeze becoming sneeze. Um, but uh, I'm quite fascinated by how the, the sense of words changes over time. And so you get a root that seems really unconnected with what the modern descendant is. So that's that's what I would say is the, the mm. most interesting. Okay. Um, and our good friend Patrick Hausemann has asked about the word geisha. Now, I suspect Ooh. you might not be able to do this without a little bit of research. So yeah. we might want to leave that and come back to it. But he just asked about where is it from, uh, that he hasn't heard a good explanation of it, that it might come from the Chinese term for a cut flower, but... No, so mm. you don't. Do you know I don't know off the top geisha? of my head about geisha. Okay, so we'll work on that and we'll get back to you, um, possibly in a comment later, or um, yeah, because <laughs> that may take a little more work. All right, so I'm gonna make a note to come back. All right, um, Topher has opinions. Asked, uh, said that as a physics student with no training in linguistics, he finds um, Proto-Indo-European kind of hard to believe in or like it's just mm, strange yeah. and wonders if it's accepted as fact among linguists you know what is the state of the sort of right situation well of course it, we can't say it's fact um it's a hypothetical reconstruction that's important to keep in mind which is why it's always crucial to mark uh, a proto-indo-european root with uh, an asterisk that means it's a hypothesized form a reconstructed form 
Um, so, but of course, when I think the Proto-Indo-European theory uh, is widely accepted as, uh, you know, very likely, we have a lot of good evidence for this, um, you know, the, the various, when you start comparing the various Indo-European descendant languages and see these roots happening and seeing particular uh, the, the uh, systematic sound changes that happen. Um, so like Grimm's Law, certain consonants becoming uh, from, you know, changing from their Indo-European uh, form to the Germanic forms. It's so uh, consistent that, uh, you know, it's statistically highly likely. To put it in physics terms, I suppose, there are a lot of things in physics that we can't, um, we can't directly measure or directly see, you know, things like uh, what's happening uh, in um, solar systems far away we can't or at the quantum level or at the yeah. quantum level um but i was thinking in particular you know we can't directly see all these exoplanets that are being found but we have lots of good uh evidence for their existence um so it's a bit like that i suppose and uh with the, at the quantum level i suppose you know when we um recently discovered the um uh the what's it called the the hadron Oh, oh the, the biggest one, the, the, the most Higgs, recent one. Yeah, the, the Higgs, Higgs boson Higgs is bo what you're talking about? Boson, yeah, boson, yeah. I meant to say. Um, that uh, demonstrated the, mm -hmm. the existence of um, why why mass happens, the, mm -hmm. um, the theoretical foundations for that. Um, again, it's a question of uh, it's be becoming statistically certain rather than um, absolutely uh, directly mm -hmm. um, observable. observable. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a bit like that. Yeah, that it... That it it's an it explains what it explains the the existing languages better than any other any other model. yeah and but then when you actually are able to i think the thing that always seems the most amazing is that one can actually reconstruct all the way back to an actual sort of root yes it's one thing to say there was a language the fact that it can be reconstructed it seems like there's so many steps yeah. but i mean i think it is just a matter of each one being a logical step that accrues um and there's only so far back we can do that, which mm -hmm. is why you can go back as far as Proto-Indo-European, but attempts to trace things back even further have been unsuccessful, really, um, because the language has changed too much uh, at that length of time. And so it's it's mm -hmm. impossible to come up with or very difficult to come up with uh, an idea of a proto-language, a proto-world uh, proto mm -hmm. language, yeah. uh, the, you know, the first language of there's all a, the languages. There's a native Lang video on proto-world that's yes. good, that if you want to look more into, our, our good friend uh, over at Native Lang has a good video on proto-world and where the sort of state of the question is right, right. now on that, so I would recommend that one. Um, okay. I'm going to ask Edmund's question in a moment because he has he has typed it at least eight times now. Okay. So Edmund, I'm going to get to you in a moment. I just want to answer a couple of things that, yes, I think Koine English is a good way of putting it. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. uh, L. Thomas Trudeau, that I think that is sort of what mm -hmm. we're thinking about with a sort of Koine being the Greek that became the Greek of a whole bunch of non-native Greek speakers in the Hellenistic world after Alexander. Um and then a couple of uh, Sean Greening mentions that that's one something he observes in the Czech Republic, for instance, that people who don't speak, if you speak to somebody and they don't speak Czech, you switch to English. Right. Doesn't matter where they come from, yeah. and that it's a sort of simplified English. Yeah. Um, okay, so I'll come back to some other questions. Edmund has asked, that is our seven-year-old son. So hi, Edmund. <laughs> um, has asked multiple times, where does Old High German come from? Old High German comes from Proto-Germanic. Um, so it's specifically of the uh, West Germanic branch, um, which is further subdivided into, um, you know, Old High German and Old English and uh, F Old Frisian and, and so forth. Um, so it's one of three branch. It comes from one of three uh, broad branches of the Proto-Germanic language. There's North Germanic, um, which includes uh, all the Scandinavian languages, for instance. Uh, there is uh, the West Germanic. That's the big one that gets Old English, um, Old High German, and so forth. And then there's the East Germanic, which uh, there's only one uh, member of that family that we know about, um, and that is Gothic. Okay. <laughs> You can answer it more fully later, Edmund, if you need it. <laughs> but thank I can you. show you some language trees to, uh, to show but, how that all But thanks for the question. Yes. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, okay, we have a question from Julius Targa, Targa, 
her, her yen, which is, I'm pretty sure, not how that's said. And I'm pretty sure it, uh, it's a reference to something, but that's okay. We'll leave that for a moment. Uh, just what do you think of Slavic languages? Linguists often kind of leave them out. Well, they're very important to the study of um, particularly uh, Proto-Indo-European mm -hmm. um, because it represents one whole branch of, of uh, Indo-European languages. So it's uh, crucially important for uh, working out um, the certain sound changes. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, just in a, as a sort of personal connection, my sister uh, studied Slavic languages, more modern uh, Slavic languages, not uh, the historical side, but she, mm -hmm. she got her uh, PhD in Russian literature. Mm -hmm. um, out of the fact that our family took a trip to, to Russia uh, back when we were teenagers, and so I've been fascinated in, in, uh, in Slavic languages since then. The other bit of uh, important uh, Slavic um, uh, linguistic uh, background that that is of interest to me is the South Slavic language uh, tradition of oral poetry. Uh, right, yeah, which is very important for the sort of discovery of and theorizing behind uh, oral performance and oral poetry in general, which is really important mm -hmm. to Homeric studies and also to Old English, yeah. to so epic studies anyone, in general. Anyone studying uh, the oral tradition, uh, it's a crucial bit of information. It's one of the reasons I think that we have the oral formulaic theory is because of noticing this um, similarity between the South Slavic oral tradition and uh, ancient Greek. The famous work of Lord, Albert Lord and Milman Perry on uh, South Slavic oral poets mm -hmm. who did oral poetry there. So I'm quite interested in scholarship about that. Mm -hmm. um, all right, more questions, sort of related. Um, Shlomo Goldstein, and then there are several other words that I did not write all of down, your name. <laughs> uh, what do you think of Old Church Slavonic? Ooh, I don't know a lot about it, but as I say, my sister does know a bit about it. So we've talked a bit about it. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Old Church Slavonic is, uh, again, it's useful for tracking certain sound changes and um, and for establishing uh, words, how words are related. Right. Yeah. So that, that would be a, if I were going to, um, you know, sort of dip my toe in a bit more into the Slavic language, I know a tiny, you know, a few words here and there of Russian. Uh, but if I were going to do any more with, uh, with a Slavic language, it would probably be Old Church Slavonic. It sounds quite fascinating. Um, all right. Uh, knowing better, I'm going to ask his question while it's on the screen there. Uh, he says he's been a fan of a 10 minute history series on the history of pre Norman, pre -Norman English. Mm. Um, but the names are super complicated to keep track of Ethelred, Ethelwald, et cetera. Why is everyone named Ethel? Ethel. So, A E T H E L. Yeah. Ethel. yeah. Compounding is uh, an important uh, naming convention in Germanic languages. So, very often, uh, Germanic. Germanic names, particularly these these old English names, will be made up of two uh, elements. So, like Beowulf, um, Beo meaning bee, wolf meaning wolf, be wolf is a bear. Um, but in addition to that, I mean, um, in in terms of real life names, there's Alfred, Alfrich, um, all the Ethel words. Um, these were very common uh, name elements that kept getting used and reused. What does Ethel mean? So Ethel means uh, noble. So there you go. That's why everybody's named Ethel, Ethel. because you're going to name all your kids noble. Yeah, especially if you're in a, <laughs> in a royal noble family. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, uh, Athel, I suppose I should not Athel. say Ethel. Yeah. Well, Athel becomes Ethel. Right. So the so the, turns turns into the a ash feminine becomes name? an e. Okay. Um. All right. Uh, William Van Der Beek asked us, and hi, William. Um, <laughs> I want to say now properly that we're sorry we never pronounced anything. We never pronounce anything in Dutch properly. <laughs> well, we did once. We got a good one. Yeah, we got a, got a good, got a good once, one. Yeah, there. but then we're bad at it. We yeah. apologize. <laughs> <laughs> um, he asked if there are any changes you cannot abide. abide. You know, as a linguist, I try not to, to language peeve. Um, but you gotta, don't you still have uh, opinions? No, I find them interesting because they <laughs> tell you something about the context and the speaker um, that is important. Um, so, no, I, I don't think I do have language changes that, you know, bother me so much that I just can't stand them. I try to, I try to anyways, uh, find them interesting and look for, you know, what's going on behind them technically, you know, behind the scenes and, and, and sort of study them rather than complain about them. That's, <laughs> that's my attempt anyways. I complain sometimes. <laughs> I feel 
ideologically completely on board with you, but that doesn't mean that things don't annoy me. But I can't actually think of anything right off the top of my head. It tends to be yeah. pretty passing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, I know one. I know one I was complaining about really recently. It's that um, when people spell the past tense of the verb lead as L-E-A-D, because when I read it and it says, and what they mean is led, like he led me down the path, but they spell it L-E-A-D, I genuinely get confused because I think he lead me down the path. He what? He led like L-E-A-D is the word for the metal and L-E-D is the past tense of the verb. But I really do think that's changing. I see it all over the place in mm -hmm. quite educated um, type, you know, not in well proofread stuff, but I see it enough that I think it's changing and it, uh, whatever it'll change. But at the moment it throws me every time I see it. And I, like to me, those are the things that are worth at least mm -hmm. trying to keep an eye on things that genuinely cause confusion. Like if I know what you mean, whatever. But if I'm actually have to stop and reread the sentence to figure it out, you know, maybe that's on me, but also that's something mm. that if you're trying to write clearly, you want to avoid because you don't want ambiguity if you can help it. So that's that one I, I grumped about recently. <laughs> <laughs> I just remember grumping about it in front of my class. Well, so. <laughs> worry not because I think we're going to lose all of those uh, so-called irregular verbs. So it'll become leaded me down the path. But it won't. But that's not the way it's going, right? It's not doing that. Maybe. They're they're just what they're doing is they're uh, for some reason led the metal. Yeah. Is caused even though LED is the more obvious and short form like that's the more regularized mm. way to spell that sound. L E D is more regular. Yeah. They're not changing the word. They're just changing the spelling. Give it time though. They'll all disappear. <laughs> okay. Okay. Getting back to this. Um, I don't think we're going to be knighted, unfortunately, because Canadians can't be knighted unless we give up our citizenship. That's true. Like Lord Black. <laughs> Actually, I, no, it must be like the knights too. It was lords specifically for mm -hmm. Lord Conrad Black. Mm -hmm. But I'm assuming that it's true of knights too. Not anymore. So. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, I'm sure it would happen. <laughs> it's only that minor complication. Um, do you suspect any link between any Indo-European language and any Far East language like Mandarin? Asks Martin Poirot again. Well, there's certainly words that get borrowed from uh, from various Asian languages, um, but a more direct route would have to go back uh, further than Proto-Indo-European. So then we're talking in you know stuff we can't trace back. World Proto World, and then we can't trace back that far. Okay. Uh, do you think, uh, Thomas Trudeau asks, do you think that Etruscan was or is an Indo-European language? Why or why not? Well, I'm not an expert on this, but I, you know, the, the common consensus is that it's not. Um, yeah. We just don't have enough uh, surviving Etruscan. To, that we can read. And that understand. we can read um, to, to be able to say. Um, so it's, it's a hard thing to study. Yeah. Yeah. I don't have any opinion on it either. That's beyond what the expert opinion is, which no. is that it's not. Uh, okay. Do you see Mandarin becoming more dominant, at least in the East Asia re region? Yeah, I would imagine so. Yeah. Again, I yeah. don't know the enough of the details of um, sort of exactly which linguistic groups are going to have win out, but it certainly seems to be doing so at the moment. Yeah, Mandarin, and uh, I would also guess Hindi would become uh, very important. Uh, do you feel that studying etymology has become more popular? Ask Martin. Yeah, I think I think it has. Um, I you know as I say, people seem to be fascinated about mm -hmm. where words come from. Though I will say, it's always been popular. It has. I mean, you yeah. go back to the Latin. That's true. You go back to the Latin authors we have, and they're etymolog etymologizing all over the place. They and and there's all of the tradition of thinking that etymology is truth. There's truth. the entire medieval yeah. tradition which says if you can figure out the real root of a word you'll know what god means mm -hmm. so i think etymology has always been popular how much uh, the fact that it's more popular literally popular like mm -hmm. more people in everyday life know about it may just be a matter of more people knowing more about language than they used to yeah. about other languages yeah. than their yeah. own and language history and more i suppose one thing that probably drives it a little bit is uh, more bilingualism or multilingualism when you know when you see yeah. these two words sound a bit yeah. alike in, in the two languages that i know or three languages that i know then you start thinking hey why is that uh, so there's a little bit of discussion in the notes about geisha in the comments about geisha which i will mm -hmm. not comment on but thank you for people stepping up to <laughs> talk about that excellent um <laughs> look admin people are saying hi to you <laughs> Uh, da, 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 we're catching up. Sorry, guys. I'm just trying to catch up a little bit. Was there a guest hospitality, uh, guest right hospitality tradition in medieval England? Asks Will Defour. Ooh, that's a very good question. Um, 
Well, there certainly was in the old English in, 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 yeah, tradition. Yeah, if you're talking about Anglo-Saxon early, tradition. early and, and early Germanic tradition, yes, I would, I would, I would say so. Yeah. Later on, um, it gets a little more complicated, doesn't it? Yes. Though you still you can see evidence of that in some of the medieval romances. Yes. Where you have yep. you know the idea that somebody comes up to your door, you you bring them in, you don't yep. ask who they are, yep. you welcome them, and then once you've done so, you can't kill them. Yeah. <laughs> or the bad guys do, yeah. but the good guys don't. So, for instance, see in uh, the the poem um, Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, uh, Gawain finds a castle in a very dangerous part of the country. It's in the Wirral, which is an, uh, an area of outlaw, um, and he uh, comes to a castle which shouldn't really have been there. It's a really fancy castle, and they ask him in before even finding out who he is. Once mm-hmm. they do find out that he is one of the knights of the round table, of course, he's a he's a superstar, so they're mm-hmm. they're all over him. But um, even before they find that out, come on in. Yeah. yeah. It's Christmas too because so that he has to have, you know, a place to celebrate uh, to, you know, piously celebrate uh, the birth of, the birth of Christ and um, so yeah, so there's a bit of a duty there. Duty there. Yeah. Okay, there's a question from Edobas 101. Um, I've been trying to build some conlangs starting from Huh. Put on European roots. Can you give yeah. me an advice about which dictionaries of pi roots are the best? Are there any with phonology and sound changes? With phonology and sound changes? Well, uh, I mean, this is the, the Proto Indo European root dictionary that I use. Um, it's uh, Calvert Watkins uh, Dictionary of uh, Indo European Roots. The one drawback to this is it's it only includes roots that make it into English. So it's not going to give you, um, you know, all the, the roots that come into, that don't survive in English, that survive in other Indo-European languages. For that, you really need to go with Pokorny. That's still the standard uh, Proto-Indo-European dictionary. And uh, that, you know, that's a, I think, a hefty purchase. Uh, so, uh, but this is, this is quite cheap. So, uh, you know. So. Go with that. Go with that. It's soft cover. It. <laughs> no, well, I'm just showing. It's it's it's. No, but it's, you it's wiggle it. Yeah. So, oh know. yeah. Okay. It's soft cover. Soft cover book, so it's quite cheap. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. Uh, this is an important question. Probably the most important you've been asked so far. Uh, Topher has opinions. Asks, how do I grow a dank ass beard such as yours? <laughs> I've been I've been uh, sporting this beard for um, <laughs> a few years now. Years yeah. now. Yeah. yeah. So. Um, I guess it's patience. <laughs> <laughs> and and someone else ref- uh, said that you look like Roger Del- Delgado Ooh, on Doctor Who. In the oh, 70s. I like that. I love Roger Delgado. Yeah, I had to read that yeah. out because I knew it would make you happy. <laughs> um, okay. What's the most mysterious language to you? Mysterious? Well, I mean, uh, Etruscan is pretty mysterious um, since we, we have so little of it and we, mm-hmm. you know, we can't read most of it. Um, we don't know where it comes from. So that's quite, uh, quite fascinating. Yeah. And there's a good, uh, again, mentioning Native Lang again, uh, there's a recent video from him on uh, what uh, Etruscan sounded like. Yeah, yeah, that's his most recent one. And most it was, recent yeah, one. it's mm-hmm. good. And one of my colleagues on Twitter who studies um, the lost or the, the, non-Itali- the non-Latin languages of the Italian peninsula mm-hmm. was most impressed and said she was going to add it to her course syllabus. So Excellent. I think it has yeah. uh, the stamp of... of academic approval if it needs it which i don't think josh does but there you go <laughs> um all right uh we're fairly behind now guys sorry i'm just reading these it's too hard to keep them writing writing them down and we will come back to the ones people asked us ahead of time if we if we can at the end but um mikhail hedberg asked since you mentioned poets do you have any favorite passages poets from ancient times that you can re- recommend oh i have so many oh i have so many my favorite poet is Catullus, um, Latin poet, or favorite. My favorite poet is the Latin poet Catullus, mm-hmm. um, and I would just say read everything of his. But in particular, I love poem sixty four, which is his longest poem, and it's very complicated, and you need to read it with notes to really understand it, or to get what's great about it. But I love it, and it's also very beautiful and and interesting. But his shorter poems are scurrilous and awful and wonderful. Um, in fact. It'll be a while till it's out now, but there's a podcast called Literature and History, which is doing a very long, slow procession through all the background to Anglophone literature. And he'll be getting to Catullus in the new year sometime. And I've just read over his script for it, and he's, it's very good and a really good introduction to Catullus with some really good, interesting poems. But I'd definitely say him. But any of those, I mm-hmm. mean, and, mm-hmm. and poem, poem 16 is one of the rudest and one of my favorites. Um, there's some wonderful Horace poems too, though he's less of a favorite for me. Um, I mean, 
I could just go forever. There's so much. Virgil, um, anything by Virgil? Of course, the Aeneid, but the eclogues are gorgeous. Um, do you have any favorite ancient poets? I mean, you've got Beowulf and well, Old English Well, I can English go to, to Old English. Uh, I would, you know, obviously I love Beowulf. Um, and it's, you know, it's a wonderful read. Um, uh, I would also uh, point to uh, the, the elegies, the Old English mm -hmm. elegies. Um, to really appreciate them, you have to read them in, in Old English, unfortunately. <laughs> That's the kind of thing that does not get you friends. No, because <laughs> I mean, that's true of Catullus too, yeah, but I, yeah. well, I'm not the longer poems. I don't think that's so true of, but the short poems are, are harder in English, but yeah, yeah. Um, they don't get the full wrench, but yeah, you know. because there's, there's subtle wordplay that you only mm. really can appreciate when you're reading it in, in the original language. Um, but Beowulf is a good one to start on. I would say, um, I, I love Beowulf and it's a little more approachable, I think, to read in translation. Um, you are also being asked how many infants you can bench press, but I think the answer... <laughs> <laughs> uh, as yet unknown. <laughs> we have not put that one to the test. Yeah. Um, ba -ba -ba. Oh, somebody has an etymology for geisha. I'll get to that in a moment. You can look in the in the chat, of course, for all of this. So, um, Oh, Mara. Hi. Hi. <laughs> or Mara. I'm going to go with Mara. Sorry if I'm wrong. I think it's Mara. Okay, I'm going to go with Mara. Her... Uh, uh, her uh, Twitter bio. It's oh. the first, first, uh, uh, the so first cool. vowel is as in cat. Oh, okay. Mara. So Mara. All right. I hope that's right. If Mark I'm remembering has, it Mark correctly. has done his research better than I have. Um, how do names switch gender associations? For example, Ashley used to be a name given to boys, but now is more frequently given to girls. Ooh, that is a good question. I'm going to give you my answer to that, okay. which is that I, that they almost always go girl, boy to girl. And it's because boy names are highest status and girls get named after boys that's, but boy, girl names almost never become boy names because girls names are not true. higher status yeah that's a, a an annoying reason mm -hmm. but i've heard that talked about mm -hmm. i don't know if you have any other thoughts on that i'm wondering if it i'm wondering if there's some interplay between uh surnames and first names as well that um, is the one way that it can go the other the way other is way. um yeah. mother's names given to boys as middle names, middle names but it's usually the middle it's usually their um last names that's yeah. so the maiden names yeah. but i suppose that can then become a boy's it name becomes a boy's and, name yeah yeah and there you go she asked if does it go both directions but as far as i know and that's just a i've heard people talking about once or twice but i don't have any um citations for that hmm. so yeah um okay so <clears throat> we'll leave the geek geisha stuff aside uh, given some of the comments, it would be cool to hear your opinion of the provenance of Japanese. I know it can be a bit of a political topic, <laughs> asked Sean Greening. Do you wish to touch that? Or, I mean, it's not something you know It's not something about. I know a lot about, I'm afraid. Yeah, I think that's as far as we're going to go mm -hmm. with that. <laughs> uh, does studying etymology help you to understand any country's typical way of thinking, says Martin Pocre. <laughs> uh, speaking of controversial topics. This is a very <laughs> controversial topic. Uh, the one thing I would question is, can we even talk about um, a sort of uh, worldview of a country, mm -hmm. right? It's just too broad. It's, it's perhaps too broad a thing to, you know, co countries are too um, complex in a sense to have one, you know, worldview. Um, but there is some evidence that you can connect um, language to uh, ways of thinking. Um, and to some extent that may play out on a kind of national level. I would say probably that by learning languages, you can learn the habits of thinking yes. of some other yeah. ways, of, you know, the, the, the metaphorical connections they're most likely to make, yeah. which does not mean that at some deep level you change the way you think about the world. No. But you might think of, I mean, you know, certain words might gain associations that they don't gain in your own language because they have sound associations or something like that. So, but I mean, your videos are to, and the, the etymology study that you do to some extent is predicated on the idea that not that you can understand their way of thinking but that you can understand history, history. and what the culture yeah. of yeah, a language places mm -hmm. and how particular attitudes have been formed or particular structures of government or whatever mm -hmm. have been formed in part by looking at how mm -hmm. languages reflect maybe don't shape but reflect, reflect that change and so language change can reflect cultural change yeah so it's rather looking at the other way around i suppose mm -hmm. um ba -ba -ba. Yes, there are Roman accounts of Etruscan language, but they don't give us very much information. 
and the best account is lost. This is why I'm just answering that question there. Um, from Sardar Javier Singh Sidhu. Um, the, we're told the Emperor Claudius wrote an entire dictionary of Etruscan, but it's not, did not survive. So while we do have some references to Etruscan words, it's not enough for us to reconstruct the language entirely. It has, again, go to that native Lang video. There's, there's information about it, but a lot less than we'd hope. <laughs> Knowing better has asked, uh, Knowing better, by the way, another fellow YouTuber who I would advise you to go check out his um, work Indeed. on YouTube. So, hi. <laughs> um, please, once and for all, explain the difference between these two sets of words for me. Lay, lie, and past, past, as in P-A-S-T with a T, P-A-S-S-E-D. So, I lay or lie down on yeah. the bed, I walked, or I passed the, or passed the bookstore. So the root <laughs> meaning of the the lay lie they they're related they are they come from the same root, um, and uh, the the root sense of this is to um, to lie down. Um, lay is the causative form to cause to lay down, hence to lie it down. Um, so that's the that's the connection there is one is the the, the regular yeah. sense of it and the other is the causative to cause that action to happen. And that goes right back to Proto-Indo-European. So in that question you asked, it should be, I lie down on the bed, should being, you know, mm -hmm. we're descriptive, so things will change, but I lie down on the bed, but yesterday I lay down on the bed. Yes. So lay is the past, past tense, tense of lie, of lie. but it's also the present mm -hmm. of a different, different verb. verb related I verb. lay my clothes down on, on the, the bed. bed. Yeah. So that's when it has- I an, caused, I, Cause them to lie. Yeah. So words. lie is intransitive. I lie, mm -hmm. and it could be reflexive. I lie myself down on the bed, or and lay is transitive. It has an object. I lay the clothes down on the bed, but the past tense of lie is, is lay, lay. Yeah. which is what which confuses certainly things. Makes it confusing. Yeah. And the past tense of lay is laid. So I laid down the clothes on the bed yeah. yesterday. I lay myself down, or I lay down on the bed yesterday. But today yeah. I lay my clothes down and I lie mm -hmm. down. And what's so what's interesting there is the original verb uh, to lie down um, is a str what's called a strong verb, one of these now so-called irregular verbs that change the vowel when you put them in the past tense. Mm -hmm. So lie down in the present tense, lay down in the past tense, whereas the, uh, the causative form uh, to lie something down, or sorry, to lay something down, um, when it forms a past tense, uses the the d the regular ED, the regular yeah. ed ending so um uh, uh laid. laid down as you said yeah mm -hmm. and then past and past p-a-s-t is the noun the yeah. past mm -hmm. and also the preposition past like i walked past the store right so it's a preposition and a noun p-a-s-s-e-d is the past with the t tense of the verb to pass, to pass so yeah. i pass I passed. Yeah. Basically, though, those are just two different spellings yeah. of the same word. They're yeah. just the spelling has differentiated them. Yeah. Where they're really just the same word. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure that really helped. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, I'm ignoring a few comments here, but it's okay. Julius uh, asked again. Do you think that French vowel system descends from German Germanic languages, since the only Romance language to have more than ten vowels, and that the Franks were Germanic people? I would have. Uh, well, certainly the Franks were Germanic. The Franks people. were Germanic people, absolutely. And I mean, to a certain extent, this is true with with all the Romance languages. They absorbed something of the um, the non Latinate languages that were spoken there before. Um, so in the in the case of uh, French, it, it absorbed a lot from Germanic languages, uh, a lot of vocabulary, um, as well as I would I, I'm not an expert on this, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if um, there's a lot of phonetic um, phonological influence, influence yeah. on uh, the sound of French today um, because of uh, the, the Germanic languages. Yeah. So I don't think that the vowel system descends from German lang Germanic languages but necessarily, but is influenced yeah, by it. I would imagine that's, so. That's actually one of the things that often you talk about such and such descending from, or this is the origins, but language change is a lot messier than that. Yeah. There tend to be multiple influences on things, and sometimes you can't pick apart. You know, it comes from here, but this happened to sound the same as something else, and that made a, a real effect. Okay, cat, stop that. <laughs> Sorry. Our cat has just had to start destroying things around us just to make this easier um all right 
have a wombat. Hi, Michael. Oh, uh, I just had something that just disappeared from my chat. Let me go back up. Um, uh, da, 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 da. Have you looked at Old English swearing? Given the first ever written <laughs> F word appeared in about the 15th century and the C word in the 13th, what words were filthy before then? This is book research, honestly. Yes, Wombat. <laughs> Michael Wombat is a great author of uh, many historical as well as modern uh, stories. You should go check him out as well. Uh -huh. uh, well, I haven't specifically researched it in particular. Um, a lot of these words don't get written down in um, uh, Old English uh, because most of what we have that survives from Old English is sort of... Um, you know that a lot of it is religious material or other sort of high prestige material uh, so it tends not to to get uh, a lot of this stuff written down now certain body related words um, like shit um, does get written down for sort of medical reasons uh, i suppose yeah but that i think is partly because it also wasn't particularly it wasn't rude no it was the only word yeah. so um it's just the the sort of only what we would consider the technical word for for that body function mm -hmm. uh, please excuse the fact that my cat wishes to show her rear end to you uh <laughs> this is her one of her favorite positions she thinks she's a parrot and she sits on my shoulder so <laughs> but a lot of these so a lot of these words make it into english writing or get written down during the middle english period those are our earliest attestations mm -hmm. even though we believe them to go back to old english we don't have them written down mm -hmm. uh all right uh Sorry, I just want to catch up. I'm feeling like I'm getting behind on everything. <laughs> um, how do you do your animations? I use Inkscape. Mm -hmm. um, and in particular, I do the motion with uh, an Inkscape uh, uh, extension called Sozzy. So it does uh, sort of movements a bit like um, uh, uh, Prezi. Yeah. Um, there's now a standalone version of Sozzy, uh, which I haven't tried yet. Um, That's S-O-Z-I. S-O-Z-I, yeah. yeah. So if you search um, Sozzy, S-O-Z-I, you'll find it. Um, it. So as I said, it was originally an extension for Inkscape. So I do the design first in Inkscape um, and to make it you know, look the way I want it to look with the backgrounds and everything. Um, and then I do the sort of animation, the, the movement, the panning around and so forth um, with this Sozzy extension. Um, somebody asked, uh, the second dictionary was Picorny, right? Spell that? The second... Uh, oh, Picorny. Uh, it's spelled P-O-K. Oh, okay. P-O-K. Um, O-R-N-Y. I don't think there's an E in the, before okay. the Y. So that's what it is. Sorry about that, Edo Boss. Um, Picorny. Picorny, okay. Do you think that due to the world being more interconnected, that many, if not all, of the local varieties of English would disappear and changes to the language would happen globally? Well, local varieties seem to be quite uh, good at sticking around. So and I, developing. We and get, developing. We get a lot more. New, we've had new varieties developing even since sort of the world has become, you know, news. Interconnected and everything. Yeah. I think people are going to become sort of um, multi- Dialectal? Dialectal uh, will be used to speaking a local variety as well as a global variety. Um, okay, I'm just catching up. <laughs> uh, Mara, okay. Marcus, <laughs> I, you misremembered. Oh, I misremembered. I got it, the, I got it backwards? <laughs> backwards, yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> Sorry, Mara. <laughs> Um, okay, sorry, just catching up. Oh, <laughs> our other son, Eric, has asked, I think that the provinces of Canada etymology is cool, seeing as I feel like I should ask a question. Thanks for asking a question, Eric. <laughs> yeah, the provinces of uh, Canada. I don't know if you want to save that for a video sometime. I could do it as a video. I have my students currently doing that, so or I did. They just finished uh, that assignment a, a little while ago. Uh, where all the various provinces of Canada names come from, yeah. yeah. So uh, maybe we'll hold that one in reserve topic. for a moment. Um, <laughs> people are talking about Chinese and Japanese in the comments, but ah, I have nothing okay. really to mm -hmm. to add to that. So, oh, our, our cat's name is Esther, E S T E R, and she's a very nice cat, but she likes to lick everything and is sometimes a little intrusive. <laughs> yes. 
Um, oh, this is a question. I don't know that you know have anything to answer. Why is it that AAVE or African American oh, yeah. mm-hmm. uh, vernacular, uh, vernacular English. English evolved into approximately the same entity in different distant American cities? Ooh. There's that's quite a mm-hmm. lot of research on that. Yeah, but there's some good scholarship on that that I w- wouldn't like to uh, venture into. Just because vaguely I'm gonna, paraphrasing, yeah, yeah, vag- vaguely paraphrasing because I'm going to probably get something wrong there. Um, I, you know, there's there's a discussion of that sort of thing in uh, the standard introductory textbooks. So my students have read a bit mm-hmm. about that, um, and uh, but there are, there's some more in depth scholarship out there. Mm-hmm. Is there any logic behind defining gender in words like in French? And what is the oldest language you know giving gender? The I mean, the oldest language you know giving gender is Proto Indo European, right? Yeah. It has it has gender, yeah, but it has multiple genders, more genders than three. Yes, yes. and they're uh, you know looking outside of uh, Indo European languages, there are you know various other languages um, from other families around the world that have again gender, but not again not necessarily connected to um, biological gender. Yeah, gender is just category is, is really ba- what yeah means. basically gender is such a misnomer because of where because it happened to come out of s- labeling latin mm-hmm. um but basically the logic behind it has to do with sounds and sound changes and and also can have to do with general categories of things yeah. right yeah not necessarily sex basically so um i think the short answer in french is no there's mm-hmm. no there's no logic except for when new words are created uh, they tend to follow the sound patterns and therefore follow the gender of the common sound patterns. Mm-hmm. And when we create or add new words to French that do have a logical male or female gender, they tend to it be follows the logical, follow those. Yeah. But that's the more recent stuff. Um, have you ever listened to Away With Words on NPR? Yes, I, I, I haven't read really... <laughs> This is Neuro Transmissions, another wonderful another YouTuber, uh, yeah. YouTuber that you should go check out. Uh, they say, I think it is one of the most boring things I've ever listened to. I think you should take over the show and listen to that. I <laughs> just thought I'd tell you that. Yeah, before. yeah. <laughs> I, I've, I've listened to one or two episodes. I haven't really got into them, and maybe that's why. Um, mm-hmm. But I know they. some people recommend uh, them quite highly. Yeah, they're quite popular. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it shows the popularity of language mm-hmm. and etymology for sure i actually haven't listened to it either um i listen to quite a lot of language podcasts but i have a strange bias against anything um that's not independent like <laughs> i listen to very few radio programs that are podcasts other than a few cbc things uh, i tend to really like independent stuff so i just tend not to listen to the I, I I don't think I'm a hipster but I tend not to l- like to listen to the bigger stuff so I just haven't listened to it much so check out um, uh, talk the talk for uh, there it's a, it's a radio show as podcast but it's from an independent radio oh, yeah. station yeah. so if I was going to recommend a good language podcast to listen to that would be talk uh, the talk, talk is very talk. good well and um, our good friend who does the uh, another etymological one yes away with words uh, no, 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 you've just said <laughs> Not a way with words. Sorry. Um, um, let's talk talk is one, mm-hmm. and another is um, uh, words for granted. Yes. So those are two other podcasts that we really like. Um, words for granted is, is a particular particularly etymology, etymology one. one. Yeah, yeah, words for granted is etymology. So if you're particularly inter- mm-hmm. interested in etymology, check that out. Talk the talk. Uh, sorry, talk the talk, and um, the other one. Uh, Let's talk talk Let's are talk, both talk. more about linguistics in a general, in more, more general, general way, which way. is also good, yeah. but not technical. They're very much for anybody. Um, all right, my chat is going crazy on here. There we go. Uh, have Lang Focus? Is that do we do you know Lang Focus? Lang Focus? No, I don't know that that uh, channel. Okay, so we'll check on mm, that. Yeah. Um, yeah, several people for Lang Focus, so that's good. Great. Um, I'm going to write that down. Just give me a moment here. <laughs> I only have one hand because of the cat. Who's okay. on my other hand. Um, <laughs> oh, cat is called Billy in Hindustani. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> when will emoji enter the common vernacular? <laughs> I mean, they have in the written vernacular. Yeah. But they're not going to turn up in spoken no. language How anytime it, soon. Really? That's yeah. the whole point of them. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah. Uh, how... 
oh, how specific language, right, Golden Eagle has mentioned, how specific language is in a certain area reflects how much that culture emph emphasizes that theme. Yes, that's which is a better way of putting the many words for snow point. Yes. That a language doesn't, if a language, if people in an area really care about a thing and the dif and specifically care about differentiating types, they will find ways of expressing those types. Yeah. And then others don't necessarily. Um, and then yes, uh, well, kin words actually. Golden Eagle has also mentioned about kin words in the Chinese, uh, different kinds yes. of words that uh, for more varieties of say uncle or aunt yeah. or something like that. And that's absolutely that's something else this, you want to. This keep. is a topic that has been on my list for a while <laughs> that I want to do kinship terms. So yeah, yeah, yeah. and it's what they reflect area. about important sort of different, cultural elements. different relationships yeah. and yeah, therefore what what relationships are seen as being important. Um, mm -hmm. lots of name discussions okay. <laughs> what are some of the changes from classical to Koine Greek um, and does that give us insight into how English will change to be honest I have not studied that a lot um, not being a Hellenist I don't focus as much on the language of Greek I don't know if you have a lot to say on it not the much. basic the basic things that I know of are regularizing so irregular verbs tend to become more more regular mm. Uh, they've dropped a couple of the aspect markers, so some of the verb tenses have become sort of collapsed into fewer. So basically a number of things that have simplified and regularized um, so that words that used to have, for instance, a middle, you know, a middle and a passive voice end up with only a passive voice or that didn't have a middle voice, develop a middle voice or things like that so that things become more regular. Those are the biggest changes I know of. Uh, which is one of the reasons that if you're interested in Biblical Greek, for instance, you might just learn Koine rather than learning Classical Greek because it's simpler to learn. Right. And therefore, why bother learning the older form that's harder, uh, that there's more forms of. And I think that that probably does. I mean, a Koine English is going to be more regular mm. in certain grammatical forms, mm. like, like as you say, everything becoming ED, past yes. tenses, yeah. you know, things mm. like that are likely to happen. Um, but that's happened a lot of already to English every time it's mixed yeah. with the mm -hmm. Old Norse coming in, regularized a bunch of things in English, French coming in, regularized a bunch of things in English, because every time you've got two people trying to speak and uh, related languages in yeah. particular, yeah. they tend to simplify the, the differences. So, Yeah, we lost a lot of those strong um, verbs uh, in Middle English. There used to be many more in um, in Old English, and in, when, when you get into Middle English and Modern English, they dropped away quite dramatically, um, just because it's easier to use the, the, the regular rule of past tense is ed. Mm -hmm. Bang. Yeah, then you can learn it better you if, learn you don't, it. It's if you're to not learn. a native mm -hmm. language. Um, Wallace Pierce asks, why so few words in English derived from Welsh? <laughs> that is a much debated question. Mm -hmm. um, what was the episode that I, we listened to? What did I listen to? Was it? It might have been a le Lexicon Valley discussion oh, of okay. the argument for the Celtic roots of English. Yes, because that is one of uh, John McWhorter's um, big things. Pet topics, yeah. Pet topics um, is what influence there is. Um, if there is influence, it seems to be more on the syntactical side mm -hmm. rather than on the vocabulary side. So it just didn't pick up a lot of uh, of vocabulary. So that's another pop another podcast on linguistic topics, Lexicon Valley. Connected. Is it still going? Hello? Hey guys. Sorry about that. Don't Sorry. know what happened. Is it continuing? It says it's continuing. Okay, let me just find our. Pull up the chat. The chat. Okay. Now they're back. Hey! <laughs> I don't know what happened there. Sorry. Internet problem or something. Yeah, so it just suddenly said it's disconnected and then. But it's back. It came back. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it wasn't even the cat's fault. You'd think it would be. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. <laughs> okay. Hello. Welcome back, everyone. <laughs> All right. Um, sorry, what we were talking about. Oh, uh, it's your spelling issues. That's what we were talking yes, about. Yes. Uh, things, particularly spelling. Um, when you were a kid. When I was a kid. And, you know, they thought I ha might have some sort of language um, uh, Processing de problem. developmental problem. Um, but it turns out that I just wanted it to be explained in a different way, a more analytical way. Um, so you didn't like being just having to memorize why things. I wanted were to whatever. know well what is why does this you know series of letters make the sound that it does, um, and if you look at it uh, from a historical standpoint, it makes sense. So yeah, yeah. 
And yeah, and that's the same way as I was saying, like, it's easier to learn Latin if you can remember what words connected to what other yeah. words. Mm -hmm. uh, and it sometimes helps when you're trying to read languages that you don't know, but you know a related language to. Of course, they can also lead you into hilarious misunderstandings. Yes. So <laughs> sort of half, six of one, half dozen of the other. Two words may be related, but the sense may have shifted in yeah. important ways. Yeah. So, But that's also part of studying the history of mm -hmm. words. So. Uh, we have two children. <laughs> <Don't worry. laughs> and a cat. <laughs> and a cat. Two children, 11 and 7. And they are, yeah, they're great. Hi, kids. You're great. <laughs> um, okay, so I think we've actually caught up with stream for a moment. So let me just make sure. Yes. All right. Nobody ask any more questions for just a moment. <laughs> Let's catch up on some of the other ones that people ask. I mean, it's wonderful. Thanks so much for asking yeah, about the questions. Great. Um, so one that we just got by email uh, from Lyle Bright yeah. was uh, a little just before we started. Where does trick as in the phrase that'll do the trick come from? This is a tricky word. So uh, <laughs> uh, we can trace it back as far as Latin, um, in, in which it seems to have meant uh, some kind of evasive maneuver or something moving you know, mm -hmm. lurching around or something like that. Um, it didn't gain the the sort of um, the sense of um, a prank or something like that until a little bit later in English in, in the 17th or 18th century. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, the that particular expression, uh, uh, that'll do the trick, um, uh, comes about in uh, the 19th century. Um, you, had, you had notes on that? Yeah, so... Hmm. Sorry, I asked it out of order, didn't I? Yeah. <laughs> I, had yeah I had it in my head. I had it in my head a little while ago. Here yeah. we go. Um, yeah. So from the Latin uh, tricari, to, to be evasive, to shuffle, is the word that I was referring to. Um, but it's un of unknown origin earlier than that. Um, the meaning of roguish prank is from uh, the 16th century, the, the 1580s in particular. Um, and then it just developed a bunch of uh, colloquial sort of slang expressions. So trick as in um, uh, a, you know, in, in terms of prostitution um, to, to turn a trick or whatever. Uh, that, again, I think dates to the, um, uh, the 19th century uh, to... Uh, to do the trick uh, to accomplish one's purpose that dates to 1812, so relatively recently mm -hmm. um, uh, for such an, an old word, um, uh, to, to miss a trick, again, from the late 19th century. Uh, it, so it just developed these, these sort of colloquial um, expressions. Mm -hmm. Exactly why, I don't think we know, but um, it just comes out of the basic sense of um, you know, a prank or uh, uh, it can also mean uh, a habit which is interesting. So, you know, he's back to his old tricks again. Right. Back to his old habits. And it had that, that other sense as well. Um, okay, a few more questions from the chat. And then we'll come back to some other ones that we had. Uh, Willem asks, have we seen the movie Arrival? And what are our thoughts on extraterrestrial communication? We have seen it. So we, you could check out our podcast. podcast. <laughs> we go into quite detail about it. Um, it's actually on. So, yeah, because we saw it and we gave a sort of discussion um review of it on the so we have the endless not podcast it's our podcast which you can find as a podcast if you go to alliterative.net you can also go our other channel is alliterative podcast i think anyway it's linked from our channel so we have a youtube a youtube um, version of that podcast so there's an episode on arrival there um it doesn't have any visuals but it has uh our the audio of us talking about it so if you want an in-depth reaction to it there that's yeah that's where you could go um, we did like the movie yeah, very much. Yeah, it's a very affecting movie. Um, um, and we don't have a lot of thoughts on extraterrestrial communication, I don't think. No. No. Um, I mean, it's very hypothetical. Yeah, that's, <laughs> to say the least. Um, what would you recommend reading or listening to get into Oskin and Umbrian? Ooh. Now, I was just checking, and I couldn't find immediately. There is a The, the person I talked about who uh, liked the Etruscan video mm. is someone who works on Oskin and other languages like that. And I I can never remember, I can remember her Twitter handle, but not her name <laughs> or part of her Twitter, ha Twitter handle. So I can't tell you right now, but I mm. mean, there is work out there, but I don't think you know any. Well, there's an introductory um, Indo-European textbook that I know of. Okay. Um, I can't remember the exact title, but it's from uh, Blackwell, this is the publisher, okay. Wiley Blackwell. 
um, and it is divided into all the different Indo-European languages and looks at what sound changes happened and what the, oh, okay. the, the basics of, of each language is. So I'm pretty sure there is a, there's a whole, you know, um, section, on, section on Italic languages, including, I would assume, um, uh, Oscan and, Oscan and uh, Umbrian was right. the other one. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> if I think of it later and I can post a comment to this, uh, I'll, I'll do so of her work. Uh, oh, look, Sean Greeny likes your puns. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Not someone else. <laughs> um, Future Underground Collective Media mentions the native language Etruscan video and Essier may be related to Germanic. What are your thoughts on possible Germanic influences in the Italian peninsula? Certainly there was some. At that point, At though, that, early on? Um, they may not have made it as far as the Italian peninsula at that point. Yeah, um, yeah I don't think we know the... I, I don't know. I just don't want to speak for you. I don't know very much about it, really. Well, another great podcast that goes into that period um, is uh, the History of English podcast. Yes. I, and he covers in detail the migration of the Germanic uh, speakers. speakers. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you, I, I don't think they, went, they were that I mean, far they at that stage. Yeah, we've got the Gauls and the Celts in northern Italy early on but that's but they're not germanic speakers no. so yeah i don't know um uh, da, 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 da. sorry their chat is being weird um <laughs> keeps blinking in and well we put our pos podcast on spotify we don't get to choose that spotify chooses who they put on and they only put on the biggest podcasts we aren't big enough to be on spotify's <laughs> podcasts so unfortunately i'd love to but we can't it's on Apple Podcasts and Stitcher and uh, I was occasionally putting it on SoundCloud but I've got to say almost nobody was listening to it there and it's a big pain in the butt there so I haven't put stuff up there um, but if there's anything other podcatcher that you need um, let me know but um, I wish I could put it on Spotify but we can't <laughs> um, no special alcoholic drinks today. <laughs> I actually did think about it, and then I thought it's only one p.m. Maybe we shouldn't. A bit early in the day. But now it's our it's two. Now so, it's two, so. Yeah, <laughs> I could uh, run and get us a <laughs> tall drink or two. Um, uh, yes, Sardar. The podcasts are on YouTube on Alliterative Podcast, which is linked to on our main channel. And uh, as I said, I was putting them on SoundCloud. But I was only using the free thing, and I can only put two or three up at a time, so I'm not up to date on those. So YouTube would be your best bet if, of those bet, two. Yeah. yeah. If you were to learn a Far East language, what would you choose? Well, I did study uh, a bit of Japanese in high school, mm -hmm. uh, most of which is gone from my head now, unfortunately. <laughs> it's been so long. Yeah. Um, that was one that I was quite interested to learn. Um, but it would be uh, also interesting to learn Mandarin, uh, mm -hmm. just because it's an, such an important language. Yes, it does. It does indeed make happy the heart of any sensible amen. Omo. Uh, yes. Um, now you're making me thirsty. Mm. <laughs> Depends how long we're going to keep going. Uh, was the book to which you were referring into European language and culture an introduction, second edition? That's the one. <laughs> Very good. Thank, Thank you, you, Thomas. <laughs> yeah. I'm, uh, because of our setup, I can't type easily while we're doing this, so I can't look things up very easily. Mm -hmm. So that's the problems. Okay. What I'm going to do yeah. is, in fact, uh, prime you for the next question that we have. Uh -huh. Here, I'll open that up. And maybe I'll run and get ourselves a quick drink. Okay. I, I wouldn't want to disappoint our audience. <laughs> it's purely for their purpose. Um, so what, the next question... Oh, well, Giant Soda said that they could listen to us talk about Old English all day. That was very kind, and very I'm sure nice. you could Thank do you. so I quite happily. I certainly could do so. <laughs> um, but... Mudge the Expendable asked uh, in an earlier comment about diphthongs. What, why, and how they came to be are used and affect English's development and who else uses them. So, go. <laughs> okay, well, we'll start with the first one, the what. Diphthongs are uh, sounds that are composed of two different, they're vowels, I should say, composed of two different sounds kind of run together. Um, so, uh, if you think of the word may, um, it's, it has the, the, the main sound, the e eh sound, uh, but it ends with a little e, uh, a little i sound. So may, I'm sort of 
exaggerating it. I don't normally say it quite so uh, so heavily, but uh, may or uh, if if you want a, a nice Canadian um, diphthong house. You can hear my Canadian accent in that one. So again, that's a diphthong. Diphthongs go back in English uh, all the way as, as far back as we have records. So Old English had three uh, diphthongs. Um, they're different from the modern diphthongs. Uh, so all, all of the Old English diphthongs sort of disappeared uh, when you get into early Middle English. And then Middle English developed new whole new set of, of diphthongs, uh, which were then further developed and uh, shifted around, in particular when the, uh, the Great Vowel Shift happened around the year 1500. So th that was a, what's called a, a chain shift, where it's not just one sound making a shift, but a whole series of vowels kind of shifted in one position. Basically, they came uh, forward and upward in the mouth in terms of where your tongue is. Uh, and uh, and so certain pure vowels became diphthongs through that, and um, certain diphthongs changed to other diphthongs. So everything sort of moved in turn. Uh, now that explains, I guess, the some of the whens, uh, the why is uh, and and the hows, I guess. Uh, but the I think most Indo-European, I, I should say, also before I leave the the um, the sort of what and uh, how. Uh, most Indo-European languages, as far as I can tell, uh, have uh, diphthongs too. Uh, even Proto-Indo-European is reconstructed with uh, diphthong sounds. Um, now, getting to the why is is the tricky one. It's it's sometimes uh, hard to answer why questions in linguistics, but there's a a, a good answer to this question. I think um, they tend to develop to ease pronunciation. So if you have a let's say a back vowel sound, an ah sound or something like that. And then the, the either the, the sound before it or the sound after it is pronu pronounced in a very different part of the mouth. What tends to happen is you have a little glide sound that uh, develops um, to make it easy to easier to make that transition from the vowel, the consonant to the vowel or the vowel to the consonant. Um, and so that's how a number of uh, diphthongs uh, come about. Uh, I can point out an, uh, a Middle English example of this, uh, sorry, an Old English example of this. Um, Yeldan, um, so it when the G, the, the G sound became a palatalized Y sound, um, a secondary little vowel sound between that consonant and the vowel, the E vowel, uh, developed a little E sound, Yeldan. Um, an Americano. An Americano, excellent, thank you very much seemed appropriate. Mm. Cheers everyone. Mm. Thanks for joining us. And so you can still hear that in in the modern English um, derivative of that word yield. Um, it's yield. There's a bit of an I sound in between uh, the and we still spell it uh, to to uh, to indicate that uh, but there's a little bit of an I sound a glide sound um, between the consonant or the semi-vowel uh, and the, um, uh, the the vowel the main vowel there. Uh, some other examples uh, are, of course, well, here, here's a good one. If you if you prolong yes, as if you were going to say yes, you pronounce the yes uh, a little bit differently than when you just say it quickly. Yes, yes, you put a bit more of an e in there. Um, so that's uh, an example of that, that phonological principle of making the articulation a little bit easier. So that, that would be the why. That would be one of the whys, anyways. <laughs> there are other reasons, too, but uh, they're more complicated, I suppose. The Y is another pun. That's the Y, the y of the diphthong. Yes, the Y of the diphthong. That's right. Um, all right. Let me catch up in the Slack. Uh, would you learn Slavo, Illyrian, Bosnian, Serbian, Croatian, Montenegro? Would you learn that? Well, Whew. it's it's just a Slavic language. Yeah. But, mm -hmm. I mean, yes. Yeah, if, if you if, had all the time, I had in the all world. the time in the world, I'd learn all the languages in the world. Let me put it that way. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean that that is an interesting um, area and 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 group of languages there. So that would be quite fascinating. I think uh, probably one of the top languages that I'd I'd like to learn that I probably will never get around to is Piraha. Oh yeah, the, the uh, Amazonian language because it's it's so different in in many many ways. That's so. the one that is the favorite of your favorite linguist, Dan Everett. Mm -hmm. Um, 
what books uh, Joseph Burton asks what books do you suggest for getting into Old English so is there a good like teach yourself Old English for or, teach yourself or just a, a learning book mm -hmm. uh, here's a copy this is a good teach yourself book so Introduction to Old English by Peter S. Baker it's uh, particularly good as a teach yourself book because it has an accompanying website with uh, exercises and additional material so that's a good one to go with um, there, are, there are a number of uh, new, newer textbooks that have come out that are good. There's some online courses as well. Um, so there are certainly resources for those, you know, doing, uh, you know, taking it on uh, on their own. Another older, pull it off my shelf here, <laughs> kind of teach yourself book, Bruce Mitchell's uh, an Invitation to, uh, Invitation, sorry, Old English, An Invitation to Old English and Anglo-Saxon England. Um, it's light on the, the the heavy syntax and grammar and all of that sort of stuff, so it's easy to do on your own without um, uh, an instructor to help you. The standard textbook probably is still um, an introduction to Old English by um, uh, Bruce Mitchell and um, well, I have a copy of it here. Here it is. Sorry, a guide to Old English, I should say. This is an older edition of it, I think. Uh, Bruce Mitchell and uh, Fred Robinson. Um, it's probably a little tricky to learn on your own from this because basically it has a whole big grammar section right at the beginning of the book and you have to sort of read through it all, absorb the grammar, and then you get to the text, which is not a sort of user-friendly way to go, um, particularly if you're learning on your own, um, which is why Peter Baker is probably better for that because he uh, gives you practice texts in each chapter when you learn a new grammatical concept he gives you a little practice test text that has um, that grammatical element um, heavily featured in it so cool that would be a good one um what's the most sophisticated language to you i will predict mm. your answer to that which is all languages, all languages are, are equally, equally sophisticated, sophisticated. Yeah. <laughs> so your own language always looks sort of normal and uh you know straightforward um, or, really or really interesting weird. because yeah. you know all of all the, the tiny details. De yeah. details and something yeah. else you learn is not so So it's a matter of perspective. Yeah. Uh, do you, um, Mavromatis asked, do you think Proto Uralic and Proto Indo European languages have an early, even earlier connection that may be uncovered, or did they have a totally different creation? Um, I can't say, to be honest. Um, it's, as I said, it's really hard to go back further in time than Proto Indo European. Um, I, I know there have been various uh, sort of um, super super groupings. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's where that native lang on part of world part world, of world a video go is to. a good one because yeah. he talks about how hard it is. Like what what people have tried to do, which is make bigger groupings, but how hard that is. Yeah. So, um, Mara asks. Uh, sorry, Mara asks. Now I'm all confused. Yes. Um, do you know how semi vowels or glides became a a thing and also what language has the least sonorant syllable nuclei those are real Ooh. real linguistic linguist questions yeah. that i don't know anything about <laughs> i don't know what language has the least um sonorant syllable nuclei um hmm. yeah i'm not sure um semi vowels and glides how they become a thing well as i say i, I guess it's it, it, it may have a lot to do with our ease of articulation Mm. Not always, though, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, there's the other reasons, I would imagine. Um, look, people making connections in our chat. Isn't that nice? <laughs> Is Tolkien your mentor? <laughs> Tolkien. I like Tolkien. Uh, I wouldn't say he's... It's interesting, when I, I, I'd i read only The Hobbit, I think, or yeah, part you of were really, You were really I wasn't a, a big Lord of the Rings fan. Lord of the Rings fan uh, early from days. early on. I came to it later in life. And so I learned uh, Old English before you know, coming to all of that Tolkien stuff, which is interesting because all of my students came to it because they, they read Tolkien and wanted to. Yeah. So to Tolkien, do Old English. Tolkien's biggest connection to you for a long time was his role in Old English. Yes. Yeah. I did, I did play Dungeons and Dragons uh, as a kid, which is obviously pretty much Tolkien taken thing. straight out of Tolkien. Um, so I suppose indirectly that that did happen that way. <laughs> um. Okay, I'm going to ask another question from here because I don't want to leave, you know, people that gave us questions and I don't want to miss mm -hmm. them. And at some point we are going to have to go do something else. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is so much fun. I don't yeah. want to stop. Um, 
This one? Yeah. So Marduk, which I was very impressive to be, you know, joined by Marduk, mm. um, asked us uh, the word about the word sweet as a jumping off point for a future video. That would be interesting. Uh, it's an interesting word. Uh, I did a, a sort of tweet about it. Uh, so I also sort of tweet uh, these little um, etymologies with a nice picture in the background, short, short little etymology bite. Um, size etymology. Connect, about words that are connected. Words that are connected. connected. So two cognate words that are uh, that don't look like they're connected or maybe sound a bit similar, but their meanings are very different. So sort of surprising cognates in some way. Um, and the interesting thing about sweet is that it has these two meanings, um, taste, so the, I suppose what is the literal meaning, the, the taste of sweetness, um, but also this sort of figurative uh, sense of uh, sweet in terms of characteristic, personal, yeah, agreeable, agreeable kind, yeah. pleasant. Um, and that goes right back to Old English, uh, sorry, to Proto-Indo-European, I should say. Um, and so I connected in, in that particular uh, little tweet, um, suave and, uh, and sweet. Um, so suave originally meant just sort of pleasant. It gains it this sort of slightly, I don't know if it's a negative connotation, but sort of... Um, uh, a more specific a connotation. A more specific maybe. connotation, uh, sort of smoothly agreeable. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah. Only later, only in the 19th century, I believe. And there are a number of other related words, assuage, persuade, hedonism. So it could make a quite good jumping off point for a longer, uh, yeah, for a video. So keep that in mind I'll for another Christmas mind. one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, David Harrison asked, what is the etymology of arcade and how did it get from hallway to video game? Th so this route is going to, is in a, an upcoming video. Uh, so stay, stay tuned for more on this route. But basically, arcade comes from Latin arcus, meaning bow. So it's the shape of an arch, which also comes from that route, unsurprisingly. Um, so an arcade used to be a sort of covered walkway with sort of pillars and arches. And very often they were used in these sort of big public buildings where you would have little shops mm -hmm. um, in, in the sort of alcoves of the arcade. And so it transferred over to the, 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 the shops themselves. Um, and in addition to, you know, shops that were buying and selling items, um, there were also sort of what were called amusement arcades. This is all back in, in sort of the, the 18th and 19th century. And so there were amusement arcades that had little amusements in them or something like that. And that transferred over when technology moved on. Uh, amusement arc the, the new amusement form of amusement was video games. And so you have video arcades, which are video amusement arcades. And from that, it shifted to referring to the games themselves. So um, arcade game. Right. And that's going to turn up soon with that root. That the root, root is, is from. yeah, the, where that root is from, that arcus, the, exactly. the, that, that Latin root. And I'll go back even further to the Proto-Indo-European arcu. Right. So that's a sneak peek. Yeah. Um, all right. More questions. Do you think Mongolian is related to the Turkic language? I don't think you have an <laughs> you opinion on that. I don't think you? I have an opinion on that. Yeah. <laughs> Great not. Yeah. We, at bottom, you may have noticed that our history did not say that either of us were trained linguists. I mean, when you come right down to it, like as, in a wider sense, in a right? wider sense, you did sense. not do the no. full. If you had done a linguistic PhD, you would have done a bunch of historical linguistics outside of English. You would have done Maybe. like. Depends what area yeah. of linguistics you use. You, you but you would have on. done sort of in the undergrad or mm -hmm. whatever. You probably mm -hmm. would have done a bunch of more generalized stuff that Possibly. might have. Yeah. But, you know, so you don't know as I, much I call about myself a philologist, yeah. which is, I suppose, um, a kind of uh, historical linguist. Yeah. So, but you're very focused on I'm English. I'm very focused on and yeah, the Germanic languages. Yeah. And, and English, so. uh, Old English, um, Old Norse. Not to say that we as don't well have, as Latin. Yes. Not to say we don't have any opinions on anything else. Mm -hmm. It's just to say that we're not really either of us experts on sort of lots of other language families and language groups so uh but you know if we have any thoughts we'll say them uh so ivan jorgensen mm. asked do you consider the italian languages two past tenses as two real tenses or just a single tense with two different semantics and emphases and i think we don't know enough about italian's past tenses to mm. answer that so I know I know a little us... bit more what happened in French, mm -hmm. um, you know, how how the tenses from Latin mm -hmm. translated over into to French. I, I know less about Italian, I'm afraid. So if you tell us what those two tenses are, we might be able to answer that. But I I don't know as much about them. Um, 
David J. Peterson. He made the languages for Game of Thrones. Yes. Yes. Uh, he, yeah, he's big in the conlang world, Zelpa mentions. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, so he's done... And he's, um, he's been interviewed on a number of these podcasts. Yeah, so, so that's I've heard I've heard from him. Yeah, and I've um, spoken very briefly with him on Twitter when he first joined Twitter, but I mean just in a, in passing. And other than that, I don't think I've, mm-hmm. we've had any interactions with him. But he's certainly really uh, somebody who's very uh, interesting for what he does and has managed to also become, I think, very articulate exp- Ex- explaining yeah, it. To he people. does a really good yeah. job of talking about the process. Mm-hmm. Um, and. Uh, Mara, yes, I know the pasta effect. I see what you mean about that. Canadians, we have been mocked by many an American for saying pasta. Instead of pasta. And, yeah, instead of pasta. And what is the other one? Um, nachos. Oh, instead of nachos. Yes. Right, okay. So, yeah. na- uh, nachos and pasta. There. If you're an American, you can laugh at us <laughs> for our funny Canadian pronunciations. Um, oh, yes, philology is very important to us. Thomas, I mean, I, you call yourself a philologist. Mm. I literally was trained in philology in right. the sense that that is what classics was called for a very long time. Right. And the departments in which I was trained were very much philological Logical. departments. Yeah. So in that sense, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not saying you're not one. I'm just saying that I am sort of like almost literally well, <laughs> just a philologist. The, the main major courses that I took in my graduate mm-hmm. work were, were philology. Old English philology and Middle English philology. Yeah, Those that's are the how specific they were labeled. course yeah. titles. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. We didn't bother labeling any of our courses that because that's all I really did. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was literature, and it was, but it was all from well, a philological a, point of view. It was a, an interdisciplinary program, too. You, you could do Yours other was. No, you yours know, was. Well, mine was. There, was. there were some other... Um, non-language related areas of classic history certainly. no there was but the, i'd say the historians in my department were very much philological history oh, okay. i mean i would just say it's a, it was a very in some ways a very old-fashioned department at the time which meant that philology was the basis of everything mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. Um, that this is very in <laughs> inside baseball stuff so i'll leave it at that um oh passata prossimo and passata remoto okay uh, for past tenses, but it's mostly because okay, so that sounds a bit like f- what happened in French. Then, uh, well, that's we were thinking about the future. Oh, I'm thinking about the future. future yeah, F- future push. Yeah, um, yeah. I I don't know as much about that uh, then because I mean, Latin had an imperfect, a perfect, and a pluperfect. And if it only turned into two, then I would assume that they might have gone sort of with the perfect and the pluperfect. But I'd have to look that up. I don't. I should know Italian better than mm. I do, given I work on Latin. So, um, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, not, other people are saying, yeah, they're talking about that it's about what's near and past. But if the question is, and, and if they are about different times, then that's different tenses. Yeah. If they're constructed yeah. about mm-hmm. different times, that is what different tenses are. Yeah. Um, the YouTuber Dr. Jackson Crawford has a YouTube channel where he does nothing but talk about Old Norse. Ooh, so there's excellent. something. So I somebody, I think I passed by this, but somebody asked us for recommendations for good YouTube channels and podcasts. Mm. Um, we've mentioned a bunch, but I mean, YouTube channels specifically, uh, Native Lang and uh, Zidnaf. Zidnaf, yeah. Does, I think he pronounces it Zidnaf. He has a whole, whole video, video on about how, how he pronounces pronounce it. Zidnaf. Right. It's X-I-D-N-A-F. Um, and he does really interesting yep. stuff with language. Um, well, Lang Focus, we've been told to, yeah. to check out. We didn't know. Uh, the Ling Space. So oh, yes. if, if you want the technical side rather than the historical mm-hmm. side of linguistics, um, of linguistics uh, uh, Ling Space is excellent. Mm-hmm. Um, what other good language channels do, I, do we know of? Not as many. No. Yeah, Podcast, more podcasts. Podcasts, Talk the Talk, uh, Let's Talk Talk. Words for, Words for granted, linguist, uh, sorry, Lexicon Valley, history of the English, English language, language, absolutely excellent, yeah. for sure recommended, fabulous. Um, is that everything? I'm, I've, I'm going to feel awful if we've left somebody out that we listen to, but those are the ones I can think of yeah. for language. I mean, I could recommend other podcasts from here till mm. when the cast come home. If you're but. looking for other uh, YouTube channels in general, check out uh, for, for educational yeah. YouTube channels. Uh, check out uh, We Create Edu. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can check that out on on Twitter, or there, it's got a, a sort of channel that has a, a list too of related channels, and the, it's a part of it's a bunch of small educational or small and medium sized educational channels that are really good and we're part of mm-hmm. and we would recommend all of them there's a bunch of science a bunch of history um a whole bunch of interesting channels there so 
if you're looking for more YouTube channels, definitely go there. Um, yeah, because we're getting more about the, the Italian, about uh, the saying that the um, past prossimo could be used to describe Caesar's actions because of the effect still felt like it was, wow. the effect is still felt. Okay. So, yeah, I'd, ha I'd have to look into that more. That sounds, that sounds interesting, though. I should, mm -hmm. I should look into more of that and tell me. Whereas some, someone kicking you in your childhood could be done passato romelto because you don't care anymore. Yeah. yeah. Its effect is gone. So that sounds as much about aspect as it does about tense. Yeah. But there may be both. Um, <laughs> because you love philology, are you philophilologists? We are. <laughs> <laughs> we are indeed philophilologists. Very good. Very good, Mara. Um, how are language... How... Yeah, how was language invented? How did language come about, Mark? Would you just Ooh. answer that? We've got a couple of hours. <laughs> oh, thanks, Jade. Hi. <laughs> that is uh, a topic of much debate. Um, and uh, there are a number of people who I can recommend, um, you know, checking out on this subject. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, we mentioned Dan Everett before. He's got a new book that is just about to come out or has it yeah, already come out? Yeah, I'm not out? sure. I'm not sure. Um, but if it's not out yet, it's very soon coming out um, on How Language Evolved. Uh, and also another uh, another linguist that I quite like on this top topic is Tecumseh Fitch. Okay. Um, and he was interviewed on The Ling Space, uh, so check that out, uh, that episode out in particular, if you're interested in language evolution. Right. Um, there's a lot of argument about it, there's because a obviously lot it's very hard to mm -hmm. know. I, I tend to like the um, the either the gesture or the um uh the song the music uh uh theories um that it came out of music came out of music probably possibly imitating um natural sounds and then you sing as you work uh or as as you walk or whatever um as a kind of communal bonding mm -hmm. thing and eventually language de developed out of that Though one has to say the gesture theory, so that we started gesturing first, and then language developed out of gesture, there's some strong uh, evidence for that too, since we still find it hard to speak without gesturing. <laughs> so it seems to be in the brain connected very deeply. Um, okay, Paul McGilvery, hi Paul, um, asked about French since you were talking about French yes. but before we get to that I will just say that Sardar that's a very good point I will link the podcasts and videos that channels that I talked about in the description of this video but I won't be able to do that until after the stream is over but I will definitely do that and when this uh, stream is posted you can go to the description and find links to all the podcasts we mentioned and the YouTube channels yes. you mentioned and I'll try to put the books that you talked about yes. too right the old English books and the proto-indo-european root books right. in there mm -hmm. so I'll put all of that stuff in there so you can check on it later Thanks for that. Okay, so um, French tenses. French tenses. Uh, I'm about to actually uh, post a blog post mm, um, on the future. On the future tenses. Um, so future sample and uh, uh, future crush. Um, so maybe about just talk about the past. Past. Or do you actually know more about that? You really think about the future, weren't you? I was really thinking really about the future, because that's where I've done my research. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the past tenses in French are actually pretty much, other than the future, than the passé simple, which is a bit right. weird. Weird, yeah. Um, they really still mirror the Latin tenses. Mm -hmm. So you have plus que parfait, and parfait, and imparfait. Right. Right? Which are imperfect, perfect. Uh, these are not parallel, but imparfait is imperfect. Parfait. Uh, passé, so passé composé is not called parfait. Passé composé is equivalent to the perfect, though it did not come yeah. by form out of the perfect. But the so passé composé, tense. Mm -hmm. the passé composé is equivalent to the perfect, mm -hmm. and then the plus que parfait mm -hmm. um, works that way as well. But it's also a composed tense, right? So it dropped, except for the imparfait, it dropped, and the imparfait is, is also done differently. Mm -hmm. Okay. I don't know how French works. <laughs> I just realized it has the same tenses, but clearly all of them de redeveloped rather than coming out of the same forms as the Latin. So, Paul, the short answer is we, we actually don't know, even about though the, we said yeah. we did. We don't. <laughs> but I do know about the development of uh, the future forms, 
which I gleaned mostly from uh, a book by Suzanne Fleischman mm -hmm. called The Future in Language and Thought. And she's mainly a, um, or was, she passed away a while ago, um, a um, romance language specialist, mm -hmm. though she talks about other other uh, uh, dimensions of, of that, the subject as well. Um, and, you know, she explains how the, the just in the introduction, basically, mm -hmm. explains how uh, the the future tenses in French developed. Right. Um, but we'll post a link to the blog about the future yes, that you're it, going when, to po put, put up this up. afternoon. It's on right. the to-do list. Yeah. <laughs> so um, we'll put that in the description as well. So you can look at that um, rather than get into it all right now. Um, Corey Stamper's book, Word by Word, I have not read yet, and I definitely want to. Yes, I think it's on my... Uh, wish list. with my Amazon wish list. So hopefully <laughs> maybe it'll be a Christmas this. present. Maybe it'll be a Christmas present, yeah. Um, do you think we'll name current English as old in the future and the old one as ancient? How long <laughs> will it take to make this one old? That's not romantic. Yeah. Good question. That's a good question. I mean, we didn't used to refer to um, early modern English. That wasn't a thing until relatively recently. Right, we talked because about it was just, just old modern. English, middle English, modern English. But now there's early modern English. You really yeah. have to distinguish between early modern English and modern English now because they're quite, quite different in a lot of ways. Um, so, yeah, eventually we'll call it. We may never call it old English, English <laughs> because old English will still be old English. Yeah. But yeah, I, I suspect they'll they'll become It'll a new be name for it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yes, Delpa Linkspace is also Canadian. It's just natural brilliance on our national character yeah. based in montreal they are yeah um now now don't get into an argument about whether quebec french is proper or not i don't want to see that in our, <laughs> in our comments <laughs> all languages are proper please please <laughs> if it's weird why is it the simple past i don't know <laughs> <laughs> nobody even uses it except in writing passé simple yeah it's yeah I mean, it's simple because it's not composed, is why it's simple. Yeah, it's, it's only it's, it's got an ending rather than needing another verb. Yeah. But it's, I don't know why it exists, to be honest, anymore. We need a French language historian. Hmm. All right. I think, fun as this has been, we probably should wrap it up. Um, there was one other thing we were going to do, and I think maybe you could do that before we go. Mm -hmm. Um and this has been so much fun. I think we may have to find a time to do this again. Maybe Probably not terribly soon, but do it again mm -hmm. because it has been lots of fun. Um, but we, you did have a couple of books that yes. suggestions that you wanted to make um, because we're fairly often asked about suggestions for good books for studying etymology. And right. then we also have some books that you think might like. So we'll do that, and then we'll and we'll put those in the description afterwards as well. And then we'll probably wrap up, so just to give you an idea. Right. So if you're interested in etymology and you're you're kind of starting out on this subject, I would highly recommend this dictionary. You'll probably find it with a different cover. Um, this is a kind of old printing of the thing, uh, but it's uh, the Dictionary of Word Origins by, oops, I'm covering up his name. There we go. John Ato. Um, it's a good starter level uh, etymol etymological dictionary. Uh, he explains things quite clearly, and uh, with each entry, he gives some a, a collection of uh, sample cognates. So it's good for finding those connections, the surprising connections. Mm -hmm. I've already recommended the uh, the uh, Calvert Watkins book, but here it is again. So the American Heritage uh, Dictionary uh, of Indo-European Roots. So also highly recommend and then of course you know you can't go wrong if you if you can get access to uh, the Oxford English Dictionary online mm -hmm. uh, and but for free you can also you should uh, go to um, the online etymology dictionary at etymonline.com mm -hmm. it's been uh, the website has been newly revamped to have uh, really a really good um, mobile interface mm, yeah. so it makes it much easier to use now Mm -hmm. So check that out. Um, it's a really, really great site. Uh, I think those are all the, the main etymology, ones, etymology yeah. ones that I would recommend for as, as sort of starting sources. And then just a couple of books just by people that we like and whose books are good. And who have recent, recent, <laughs> and recent recently books. published books. Or about books. to come out books. Or about to come out books, yeah. One of them is A Short History of Drunkenness. 
I don't know why we would like that, uh, by Mark Forsyth. And Mark Forsyth is a writer on language who has lots of really good yeah. stuff. So he's most famous for writing um, The Etymologicon, which is a great book. Mm -hmm. um, and The Short History of Drunkenness is of drunkenness, but also of language, the, the language, language and history of, language and, of drinking. and culture surrounding drinking and, and so forth. Yeah. yeah. And Martin, yes, we will post this on the channel as a public video after it yeah so you can done. check out and all the um, so you should be able to look at it and yeah maybe download it i don't know but you can certainly look at it and re-watch the stream if you want um uh so next up uh anything by paul anthony jones i would say mm -hmm. he's so he's most famous for his haggard hawks uh, uh twitter. twitter uh site uh so you should follow his twitter twitter feed first of all um and he gives lots of really fascinating unusual words every day um, but he's got a new book um, that is just coming out, or has just come out. Uh, yeah. The no, that's that's his previous book. Sorry, Ca the Cabinet of Linguistic Curiosities. That's the new one. Mm -hmm. Only available at the moment, uh, as far as I know, in the UK. Mm -hmm. But you may be able to order it from overseas. Um, uh, but his uh, previous book, uh, The Accidental Thanks, Dictionary. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I just had to reply. Thank you, Inez. <laughs> um, yeah, the Accidental Excellent Dictionary, Dictionary. Uh, has just been published in North America. It was already out. It was in already the UK. out in the UK. It's now available in North America. So, uh, for you, for those of you like us in North America, that's a good one to go with. Lots of fun. And then the other books are uh, some books that we actually talked about on our podcast. We had interviews with the authors, and we have another one that's going to be hopefully, hopefully, we'll be able to do an interview with the author. Uh, they're not language books particularly, they're history books, but one is by Mike Duncan, famous podcaster of History of Rome. Uh, his new book is The Storm Before the Storm, and we have an interview with him on our podcast. Uh, that is, But the book, whether or not you listen to the podcast, the book is really good. It's about the from the Gracchi to Sulla, the sort of generation before the generation of Pompey and Caesar. And also we've just talked to Richard F. Thomas about his book, Why Bob Dylan Matters, which is a book about Bob Dylan and the classical literature. So those you might be interested in. And we're going to hopefully be talking about the new translation of The Odyssey by Emily Wilson soon as well, which is also fabulous. So just some recommendations. Yeah. Christmas I shopping. <laughs> I see that somebody said that they already had all those books about etymology. Oh, okay. And can you have any further recommendations? Further recommendations? But those are basically what you use, right? That and those the OED. That's basically what I use. Yeah. Um, there is, um, there are some others, um, harder to get uh, one's hands on. Um, let me see what, uh, what would I recommend. I mean, there's lots of good sort of popular books, but in terms of, yeah. So, but in terms of resources, I think those are pretty much the ones there are for English anyway. There's one more I would recommend. Let me mm -hmm. just pull it up here. Uh, my iPad. And thank you to everybody who's saying lovely things about the channel. Really appreciate it. And thank you. Yes, we're, I mean, getting to 10,000 subscribers, I know it's just a number, but it really did make our day. The whole family was, we got, we woke up to 9,990. And literally all four of us, including the two kids, were sitting and refreshing to wait to see the moment when we hit 10,000. It was very cute to see how excited the mm. kids were, too. So we really, really appreciated it. And uh, so and thank you so much for joining us. Sorry. Mm -hmm. you, I'll, so the, la the, uh, 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 the last recommendation I'll make is Klein's Comprehensive Etymological Dictionary of the English Language. It's super expensive and almost impossible to find. <laughs> but there are pirated copies floating around in the Internet naughty um <laughs> so so that would be good too that would okay. be good too cool and uh yeah so i'm just reading through everybody's saying such nice things and um we will definitely post all of this an article of, about uh early colonial cocktails yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's another there's a whole other field of good cocktail books out there yeah. and cocktail history uh, david wondrich is yes, the big yes. name imbibe in cocktail in, is the name of yeah. that one and well he's got some others some but, others but that's his big he's one, big name in, in cocktail history so there's mm. that too yeah um i don't know that we'll wait until 15k to do another another live stream because this has been so much fun so you know we'll we'll do what we'll we keep can you posted yeah um i don't know if we'll be up on other platforms anytime soon it, it's uh, it also on other social medias we're getting i think to the limits of our ability to, to keep track to of manage, everything yeah. <laughs> this is a two-person two-person operation and it's it's a lot of work along with you know 
work. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe if it ever becomes a full time thing, we'll be able to do a little bit more. But uh, yeah, <laughs> we'll see what we could do. So thanks everyone for joining us. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah, totally amazing. We didn't know if anybody would be interested in listening <laughs> to us natter on. So it's just been amazing that you've had so many uh, great questions yeah, and given us a questions. chance to, to chat with you when we normally just get to say things and not hear a lot back. Mm-hmm. So we'll put links to everything in the description and thank you again. And thanks for joining us. Thanks for all your support. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>